program is from NET, the National Educational Television Network. Good evening, Jumbo. It's been a month of change for the black activist movement, both in leadership and in policies. In recent days, usually conservative Urban League head Whitney Young has endorsed black power. The old guard of the NAACP, led by Roy Wilkins, has beaten back a determined challenge to its leadership by a growing faction of young Turks who walked out of the Atlantic City Convention. Their leader, Wichita attorney Chester Lewis, blasted the organization as an appendage of the white power structure unable to free the black man in America. Major changes took place in the Congress of Racial Equality last week. The scene was the National Corps Convention held in Columbus, Ohio. Corps members got together to develop programs that would lead to the creation of a black nation state with black controlled businesses, politics and education. The convention theme was black unity. Corps invited guests that in represented the entire range of thought concerning the black struggle. Your permission to say Roy Wilkins, executive secretary of the NAACP, addressed the Corps convention. I am 66 years old, and I have been in the civil rights movement since I was in high school. I have never been afraid in any gathering of my people and I am not beginning today. I consider that I am in the house of people who are going the same way I'm going although they may have a little different route. People who disagree with some of the things I believe in and I disagree with some of the things they believe in but we're all going in the same direction and all seeking the same goals. And for that reason, I'm very happy to accept the invitation to bring greetings to this convention of the Congress of Racial Equality. It is no secret that under the incoming Innis regime, CORE is committed to a philosophy of what has been called loosely black nationalism. It is never clear, except in the most outspoken circles, whether this term means the building of pride in race and the assurance and achievement that such pride instills, or whether it means actually the building of a black nation. Let me hasten to say at once, and then be done with it, that if the concept which emerges is that of the building of a separate black nation, the mood, the beliefs, and the tradition of the NAACP would dictate no cooperation on that theme. There remain, however, many areas in which there can be either working cooperation or parallel complementary action. Continuing the theme of black unity, the convention delegates were addressed by Urban League Executive exactly Director Whitney Young, Jr. Sisters and brothers, we are in a war. Anybody who doesn't believe it, you ask the Black Panthers of California. I just left Oakland and I left Los Angeles in the last two or three weeks and I know what war means. We are in a war and in a war like any other war. Our war is against racism and against injustice. <coughs> Whitney Young describes a recent speech he delivered to the National Association of Home Builders. This is really a reactionary group, if you know anything about the home builders. And when I got through, one man stood up and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Young, uh, I uh, sort of agree with a lot of things you said, but I must confess I've lost sympathy with your people. I was a great liberal, and I, <laughs> and I loved your people very much, but since the riots and the shouts of black power, I've kind of lost sympathy. And I said to him, I didn't want to debate with him the merit or the logic 
in his indictment of a whole group because of maybe a few excesses by a few people, but uh, all I wanted to know is what had we lost since he'd lost sympathy? <laughs> and I pulled out a piece of paper and a pencil and I said, now would you tell me precisely all the things you did before you lost sympathy? How many open subdivisions did you build? How many black people did you employ and at what level? How many black people did you help get into your, your choice exclusive club, your neighborhood, your school? I said, now say it slowly <laughs> so I can document for posterity our great loss now that we have lost your sympathy. <laughs> and he said, well, well, I, uh, we didn't do any of those things. And I said, well, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. <laughs> you know, did it ever, did it ever occur to you that if you'd been doing all of those things when you loved my people so much that we might not have had the riots last summer. You see, until you can come and tell me this, then th that, that's why I say don't, don't talk about law and order. There will never be order. And there should never be order in this society until there's justice. Core convention achievements are discussed by Roy Innes, Associate National Director, and Wilfred Ussery, National Corps Chairman. Well, I think the success of our conference relative to uh, unity is not to be measured by the opinion of one speaker uh, relative to a particular idea that we're endorsing. Uh, I think it has to be measured against the broad uh, base of people that we brought in, such as uh, an ambassador from Tanzania, um, a Muslim minister, namely uh, Muhammad Ali, the, the world heavyweight champion. Um, Malano Karinga from Los Angeles, the founder chairman of us. Um, and many other people who came in representing a whole cross section of ideas that are operative in the black community. And I think it was clearly demonstrated that we are the organization that has the ability to convene people from such a broad cross section of opinion. Probably one of the most important things to come out of this would be the open dialogue between black people in different groups. Uh, for years we've been blasting at each other. We've been hearing about each other through the press uh, very incompletely and uh, inaccurately. We have a dialogue now. We can hear each other, not seeking so much agreement at this stage, but to just have the dialogue. Later, after having dialogue, we can find those points of agreement and then try to build unity in that. This theme of black unity was upset, however. The Brooklyn Corps delegation, along with others, walked out of the convention. And Floyd McKissick, who remains Corps National Director, although on a leave of absence, told Black Journal today, during growth, every organization experiences dissension. No pain, no progress. And basic core ideology, however, is the factor in the present dispute. The current leadership emphasizes economic policy and working through the system. Those who walked out believe that black people cannot fit into capitalistic America. And because of this basic dispute, no program resolutions were acted upon at the convention, and it was recessed until August. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee also completed a major reorganization. The post of chairman, recently held by H. Rapp Brown, was abolished and a governing body of eight deputy directors was formed to serve under program secretary Phil Hutchins. We talked with one of these new appointees, John Wilson, about the reorganization and the future of SNCC. New structures is, 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 is trying, the new structure will try to offset that so that the press won't be able to make villains out of either Carmichael, they won't be able to make villains out of Hutchins, they won't be able to make villains out of Rapp, they won't be able to make villains out of me or anybody else, you see. It would be harder for them to gear in on all seven of us and what makes it, and the reason why, because last year, when Rap went to jail, it was a big vacuum to be filled, you know, and everybody was wondering, well, who would follow, who would take Rap's place, you know, why he was in jail, or what would happen, or what would happen, you know, and, and what happened was that black people in the country didn't see anybody else speaking for SNCC but Rap, so they didn't want to hear anything unless it came from Rap or anybody else, so we decided not to do that again. This year, we're going to try to work basically in programmatic areas. Last year, people said that we had no programs. That was not true. 
program basically last year was the building of black consciousness in the country. And you do that through speeches and rhetoric. And that's what we did. And uh, this year we were going to try to move from a solid, firm, or programmatic base dealing with anti-war activities, dealing with freedom schools, dealing with building of a mass political party uh, on, the, uh, on the principles of the Black Panther and uh, using the Black Panther as a symbol. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference has problems within its ranks. As a result of the Poor People's Campaign, there's growing disenchantment over the leadership of Reverend Ralph Abernathy, now serving a jail term in Washington. As predicted last month on Black Journal, the confrontation between the poor people and Washington police came with the destruction of Resurrection City. Whether this had the unifying effect that Abernathy sought is doubtful. In fact, a new group has been formed by the five ethnic groups who participated in the Poor People's Campaign. It's called the National Poor People's Coalition, and it's interesting to note that not one SCLC official is included on this group. There are speculations that Abernathy may be replaced by Mrs. Coretta King. But then many SCLC members believe the organization should be headed by a strong male figure. Mrs. King continues to play a major role organizing women for social justice and has joined forces with Congressman John Conyers, Stokely Carmichael, and others in the National Committee of Inquiry, which will evaluate presidential candidates, report its findings to the black community. The black press has covered these changes in black leadership, but so far is cautious in taking a position with any one group. National Newspaper Publishers Association recently held its 28th annual convention in New York City. The organization represents some 75 black newspapers throughout the United States. The most pressing questions the publishers ask themselves, do we really represent black America? Well, I, I think that those who are attending this uh, convention cannot escape uh, the realization here among publishers uh, that they have gone, they have come very much middle class oriented and that they too uh, need to make a new approach to the grassroots uh, community. They, they, they are well, as much shocked and surprised at some of the frustrations of the ghetto as some of the white newspapers uh, were. Several of the presidential candidates visited the meeting, but it was the invited appearance of Governor McKeithen of Louisiana that caused the raising of eyebrows among some members and initiated discussions on the philosophy of the black press. Tom Picou, executive editor of the Chicago Defender, speaks to this point. The Negro press must begin to define its readership. It can no longer adhere to the general conception that all Negroes will adhere to a certain philosophy projected by the black press. In addition, it must begin to develop new readership. People who have been reading black newspapers for many years will continue to read black newspapers. But that market is a dying market. And to subsist, it must develop a new market. It must reach the young Negro, the educated Negro, the Negro that's coming out of school. Percy Green, editor and publisher of the Jackson, Mississippi Advocate, has a different view. We've got to realize that we need help and that the so-called whitey is a man who can help us, help us because he has the power, he has the authority, and more than anything else, he has the money. And you can't beg, or you can't slap a man in the face with one hand and beg him with the other and expect him to help you. The number of black newspapers in the United States has remained fairly constant in recent years, and black publishers are beginning to realize that to grow they must speak for the grassroots as well as for their middle class readers. But in most cities, the black press is still the only game in town. And like all establishments, its challenge is to be relevant, to keep pace with the rapidly changing climate of the community it professes to serve. And now some news stories as reported in the black press. Professor Harry Edwards, who plans to boycott the Olympics by American black athletes, is the subject of an article by sports columnist Larry Casey in the Chicago Daily Defender. Casey says it's not clear whether members of Edwards' ad hoc committee want to stage the boycott during training at Lake Tahoe or when the games actually get underway in Mexico City. In any event, Casey says there will be an unusually large number of white backup athletes at Lake Tahoe. 
The Chicago Daily Defender reports in a syndicated article that San Francisco publisher Dr. Carlton Goodlett tried to obtain a television outlet for black investors and lost his case at an FCC hearing. But according to the Defender, as a result of his efforts, a black may well be the next appointee to the Federal Communications Commission. The Defender said that of over 170 radio stations beaming to black audiences in the United States, only seven are black-owned. No TV stations are black-owned. The Atlanta Daily World, with a circulation of 30,000, reports a protest by Dr. Horace Tate, executive secretary of the predominantly black Georgia Teachers and Education Association. Dr. Tate charges that Afro-American principals and teachers are being phased out of the Georgia school system as a result of desegregation while white teachers remain on the payroll. He said black principals should be in charge of the schools where the majority of the pupils are black. The State Board of Education has investigated the matter and will report this week. For school boards and parents this summer of 68 is a time to take stock and lay plans for the coming school year. For a special report on the pressing problems of education, here is Panchita Pierce of Ebony Magazine. The agony of public school education, with its underfunding and overcrowding, with its often medieval and mediocre teaching standards, has been experienced by many black children throughout the nation. Let's look at one black community that has successfully moved to counteract educational erosion. The city is Boston, where to many critics, the prevailing public educational system has served only to intensify a mood of dissatisfaction. To meet this void, a group of black parents have formed a busing program known as Operation METCO, supported by federal and state funds and a private grant. Operation METCO buses some 420 youngsters from the Roxbury Ghetto to the less crowded schools in the affluent suburbs. In charge is Mrs. Ruth Batson, who tells whom she holds accountable for the educational breakdown. I hold accountable people in institutions of higher education and I hold accountable business people. And I do this because they get the product, the product being the student. They either get the product or they don't get the product. In schools of higher education, they know who, who comes into their schools. They know who cannot pass the college boards. And it is incumbent upon them to say to the local school system, this is happening. Why is it happening? And to look into why it's happening and not to collaborate with a local system to perpetuate a bad system. I think with businessmen, when they know that young people can't pass simple tests, it's incumbent upon them to find out why they can't do it, why they don't perform on their jobs, and find out where the educational system is missing. Kathy Latimer, who owns nine vivid years of life, was selected for Medco along broad economic geographical lines. Each morning, she travels the 11 miles from her Roxbury home to the wealthy suburb of Brookline. In operation just two years, Medco at first ran into resistance from some suburbanite parents, but no such problems exist today. Many of the participating suburbs claim to have cheerfully offered a home away from home for the youngsters of Roxbury. Today we're going to do something new and different. Tell me what I have. Tomato. I have a tomato, and I'm going to do something with it while you watch me. The fourth grade teacher is Mrs. Jacqueline Goebel. Who can tell me what I did to the tomato? Kathy? It's a... It's a... It's two sides of a hall. Kathy came to Brookline with a very poor academic record. She was practically a non-reader and wasn't given much credit for the ability that is obviously within her. Having been in the Brookline schools for two years, she has gained at least three and a half years 
academically in nearly all subjects. She's a very excited student, and for that reason, very exciting to have, and fits in well in the Brookline situation. The average child in the Brookline schools is of the type I'm describing when I describe Kathy. They are all excited and very enthused, tend to have a lot of ability. She keeps up with them well, and she has fit into the class well. I think Kathy is the most aware of anyone of the fact that she is Negro. A lot of this, I think, comes from the home. There is an, an emphasis on the fact that she is a Negro in the home and that she should be proud of it. I think the fact that she has been in the classroom has been good for the children. She and they both are now able to say that she is a Negro, which at the beginning of the year, I noticed all of them avoided. I also notice now that when they're drawing their friends doing something or their favorite activity in the classroom, if Kathy is playing with them, Kathy will have a brown face. And when she draws herself now, she also makes herself brown. When she first came, she always made herself white. Now she feels comfortable being a Negro in the situation that she's in. Another proud example of black community initiative in education is the privately funded New School for Children, located in Roxbury itself. Without the problem of most decentralized schools, which are dependent on a board of education for their funds, the concept here was to create a so-called magnet school, one that would attract children from all parts of Boston. This is exactly what has happened, according to the teacher author of Death at an Early Age, Jonathan Kozel a member of the New School's board. I think the key element, however, and the thing which perhaps separates uh, the New School uh, from, uh, from unsuccessful ventures of this sort is that the parents here are not merely a presence, uh, uh, an, ob an observer, uh, a, uh, an investigator on the scene. The parents here are really running the show. They have the final say. Now, I think this says a great deal, not only for the real qualities of black power at its best, and for the intrinsic capability of those whom we have stupidly designated as the culturally deprived. But I think it also tells us an awful lot about the whole phobia concerning busing. Nobody in America, so far as I'm concerned, would object to having their children bust into a black neighborhood if it weren't for the fact that they know damn well that we've been cheating the Negro kids for ages. If it weren't for our guilty awareness that the schools and the ghettos of America largely stink, white people would not be so disturbed about having their children sent in. And when you do have a beautiful place like the new school, a school which is hopeful, a school where teachers are happy, a school where kids are having fun and things are happening, then you have a problem of keeping the white families out. But the cruel fact remains that over 25,000 children in Boston are still receiving second-class education. It is these children whom the Ruth Batsons and Jonathan Kozels are concerned about. For it is these children who become transformed, even liberated, once they are given a chance to grow. Some of the things that we think are important can't be measured by achievement tests and so forth. But when I see um, children anxious to go to school, for example, when I see a little girl who's eight years old call me up in the morning and upset because she's missed the bus, and asking me how she can get to school. When I see a child who had asthmatic attacks all one year, whose mother reports that he hasn't had any this year, and when I hear the kind of things that, about the kind of things that the children are doing, then I see results that would not be measured in a classroom. A child, a poet once said, is to believe in love, to believe in loveliness, to believe in belief. It is to turn pumpkins into coaches, lowness into loftiness, nothing into everything. Let's play it. Two possible solutions. Busing, decentralization. Busing is at best a limited answer, and in the large cities, 
with hundreds of thousands of students attending segregated schools, it would skyrocket the already burgeoning education budget. So far, Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, Atlanta, and Los Angeles have moved toward decentralization. But in most cases, only limited authority has been delegated to local parent control boards. In New York City, three school districts were decentralized on an experimental basis, but they have been plagued with troubles. Local boards have not been given effective control over personnel, budget, and curriculum. To make decentralization work on a public level, boards of education must be willing to transfer meaningful authority to local boards to effectively operate and improve their schools. Teachers' unions and professional organizations must sacrifice some of their control on such issues as job security, transfers, and accreditation. At the same time, local boards must meet their responsibility with a sense of urgency and fair play. All hit, all hit, 5, 10, 15, 20 is all hit, all hit. For children, all summer is a time not five, for school, ten, but for fun. And here with a look at children's that games, night, down night, home and up in here Robert, is Leon Bibb. I got up and let them in. Children's games are much the same the world over. The only important difference is that while the games may be played in the same way, the rhymes change from country to country and within a country from section to section. There are games for schoolrooms, playgrounds, and the city streets, and the games draw their character from their locale. But whatever the surroundings, the enthusiasm for the game remains the same. I met Br'er Rabbit in the pea vine. I asked him where was he going. That's from down home. On a recent visit to the Vineland Elementary School in North Carolina, we found that southern games had much to do with animals and birds, things close to nature. For instance, they played a game called the rabbit and the hound. The hound chases the rabbit. The rabbit runs to find a nest. If the hound catches the rabbit, the hound becomes the rabbit, and so it goes. Here comes a bluebird through my window. Here comes a bluebird through my window. Take a little dance with the goosey goosey gander. Hidey diddle um day. E V I V O B. I wonder what she's got for arithmetic. Spell cat. Now it's time to change your class. I won't go to make it any more, more, more. Up north, not like down home, in the cities, the games that children play are not around trees and birds and animals. They instead uh, reflect the day-to-day -day hard life experiences of the children of the city. All here, all here. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty is all hid, all hid, all hid. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty is all hid. That's a play party game, a hide and seek game. There are many that come from all parts of the country, rural and urban. Uh, for instance, uh, hello, 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 sir. Meet me at the grocer. No, no sir. sir. Why, Why, sir? Because I have a cold, sir. Where'd you get the cold, sir? At the North Pole, sir. Let me hear you speak, sir. A chew, a chew, a chew, sir. Hello, 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 sir. Meet me at the grocer. No, sir. No, sir. I do have a cold, sir. Where'd you get the cold, sir? At the North Pole, sir. Let me hear you speak, sir. A chew, a chew, a chew, sir.
This Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black. All dressed in black, 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 black,
the red coloring matter which is essential in supplying oxygen to all the body tissues. And sickle cell trait is a related condition. Here, only a small percentage of the red blood cells have this sickled shape. One in 400 black Americans suffer from sickle cell anemia. One in 10 black Americans suffer from sickle cell trait and can pass the disease on to their children. 20,000 black children suffer from sickle cell anemia. Hundreds will die before their 13th year. Some because the disease will be improperly diagnosed. Others because they will never see a doctor and their parents are unaware of the symptoms. This is an actual blood test showing microscopic footage of the red blood cells of a sickle cell anemia victim. At Howard University College of Medicine, Dr. Roland B. Scott has been working with sickle cell anemia children for some 20 years. The patients not only have an abnormally shaped cell, but these cells are also deficient in number. During a crisis, uh, the child usually be uh, becomes a little paler perhaps, the appetite falls off, he may become listless, uh, weak, and of course may develop the uh, characteristic of most crises, namely uh, pains. A sickle cell anemia, of course, is what we call a genetic or uh, an hereditary disease. And um, this means, of course, that it has to be present in your ancestors. And uh, the nearest ancestors, of course, are, are the parents. And we have an illustration here in the Ballard family where uh, the mother has sickle cell trait and the father also has sickle cell trait. Now, the, in sickle cell trait, we have a condition where a few of the red cells in the body do sickle. However, these patients are not anemic. In other words, they have a normal number of red blood cells and uh, the, the hemoglobin content in the red blood cells is also normal. So that um, uh, these, these individuals rarely have symptoms. And as a matter of fact, many of them do not know that they have uh, the sickle cell trait. Uh, the danger is that if uh, a uh, woman with sickle cell trait marries a uh, man with a sickle cell trait, then uh, uh, the, in the case of the offspring, there's a possibility that uh, about one-fourth of the children will be uh, normal, uh, like this little girl here, and uh, another uh, quarter will have sickle cell anemia, and then about half of them uh, could have the trait, like Sandra here. So the, the danger is in, um, in marriage and, and having children. I still would have married my husband. I mean, maybe we wouldn't have had as many children if we had known, because I didn't know until just before Brian was born, my last child, that uh, there was a possibility that any children that I might have would have sickle cell anemia. No doctor had ever told me. And he was my fifth child before I found out that uh, all of the children might have sickle cell anemia. Three of them have sickle cell anemia. The oldest girl, Beatrice, 24. Brenda is 20. She's the only one who doesn't have the anemia. Chip is 15. Brian is 12, and they both have the anemia. They're just regular like the other boys, as far as I can see. I don't know. If I do overprotect them, I don't realize it. But I'm sure I did with Beatrice. She was the first child, and she was about four years old before the next child came along, and she just got all the attention. Plus, she has a congenital heart murmur. And I was more worried about the heart murmur than I was about the anemia, when really the, the anemia is what I should have been worrying about. Well, now when I have a crisis, I get real nervous and I get a pain right in the middle of my stomach right here. And it's, instead of getting better, it just gets steady worse. And it used to be the only thing that would stop it was that I had to go to the hospital and they'd give me a couple of shots, um, something for pain and something to put me to sleep. And, and it wouldn't bother me again for almost a year or so. Basic research on sickle cell anemia is being done at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Here, Dr. Makio Miriyama, a research biochemist, has built a scale model of the hemoglobin molecule, 
the oxygen transporting substance that gives blood its color. The model is made up of amino acids, protein units consisting mainly of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. These amino acids are linked together to form this hemoglobin molecule. Dr. Miriyama discovered that in sickle cell hemoglobin there is an irregular formation in two of the amino acids which link up in a looping type pattern. This looping causes the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells to stack up on top of each other, forming long, slender, sickle-like strands. The red blood cell therefore becomes sickled in shape. I feel that um, the stacking can be made to crumble under high hydrostatic pressure. There is a professor of medicine in Detroit by the name of Dr. Richard Bing. He's a chairman of the Department of Medicine in Wayne State University. And uh, it just occurred to him that uh, it would be a very simple, simple matter to put a patient into high pressure chamber, which is made out of plastics. And then he tells me that he goes up to 25 pounds no, 25 atmospheres and down in all, all in five minutes and out. And uh, he has had a number of su successful cases. The way the sickle cell crisis has been treated up till now is only symptomatic. They just give any sort of uh, drugs to kill the pain. And, uh, and I feel this is not the um, scientific method. Uh, it might, it could easily lead to drug addiction because it has to be repeated from time to time. As far as the cure for the hereditary disease is concerned, we have to get right down to the, uh, the DNA molecule. Our answer is like the belling the cat. We know, we know what has to be done, but how long how long from now, and who's going to do it, and exactly how, how, to, how to accomplish this interchange, we don't know. 50,000 black people in this country suffer from sickle cell anemia. Two and one quarter million black people have the sickle cell trait. They are carriers who can pass the disease on to their children. Black Journal urges that all its black viewers have a simple, painless, and inexpensive blood test to determine whether they have sickle cell anemia or sickle cell trait. Next from Black Journal, Black Theater with William Greaves. Back in the days when we were called Negro or worse, the black performer was often taken for a ride in the rear of the theatrical bus, a bus that usually went nowhere. This conveniently condescending image began to change in 1821 with the first black theater in America the African Company. The group gave performances of Shakespeare and other classics at their own theater in Lower New York, and in an interesting switch, provided a petition at the back of the house for white patrons. But these were white hoodlums whose harassment forced the closing of the playhouse. Black talent flexed its muscles again a decade later when Ira Aldridge moved across Europe in the form of his ancestors, the Moors, in his portrayal of Othello. Europe surrendered to the strength of his talents, and he surrendered to Europe, never returning to America. It was a hundred years until another Moor appeared, Paul Robeson. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause. Robeson's voice thundered across the Broadway stage during 296 performances of Othello, which established a record for the longest run of a Shakespearean play on Broadway. But along that avenue, so appropriately named the Great White Way, the works of only 11 black playwrights have been mounted, including those of Langston Hughes, Richard Wright, and the late Lorraine Hansberry. 1964 was the big year for Afro-American actors and playwrights off-Broadway. Ten plays were produced involving blacks.
But the man of the year was Leroy Jones, whose burning talent startled and irritated white audiences. In 1968, 115 years after Uncle Tom and his stereotype died in his cabin, black theater has emerged as an unshakable art form. It has been made cohesive by actors like William Marshall, who has performed on both the Shakespearean stage and in motion pictures. He was interviewed by Black Journal. I feel, in terms of my own role, that uh, I can't do enough. I really have to find ways of making a greater contribution to it. And it's very difficult as a black actor within the commercial aspect of the entertainment industry to do this. Because again, it's always a great struggle in terms of making sure that the content is, is uh, commensurate with a dignified and honest uh, reflection of yourself, of your people. I think that, um, no, I, th I know that it's essential that black people, as have other people who've come to the United States to, to find a better way, must build their own theater. Uh, they must start in their own communities and draw upon the rich folklore of, of their people. And it's a great necessity and there's, there's, there's such riches there in terms of new, new stories. Uh, uh, it would be a new history. It's, it's, not, it's not new, but it would be new to uh, people who would view it uh, once it's brought to the fore and, and uh, brought to their attention. It has to be there in the community. Come on! Come on! These actors are getting stronger. They're members of PASLA, a community theater in Watts, Los Angeles. Producer-director Van Tyle Whitfield. All right, now when you do that, when you do that thing with uh, ain't no hammer like, like uh, this hammer, whatever, you do, man, you do it with the upstage arm, you, you, your left arm. A few years ago, they would have been doing Our Town or Death of a Salesman or some other play written by a white expressing his culture. Today, such plays appear irrelevant. These actors know who they are. This is totally black theater. It is time. Look here. Check, it is time. For the electric chair to give birth to an electric couch. And when Jackie starts going crazy on into It is time, that stops whatever you you guys are doing upstage. Everybody understand that? Everything else is going on is going on. Okay, let's go. Their objective is no longer to prime themselves for Broadway, but to create their own theatrical environment. All across the country, blacks are patronizing their community theaters. The reason for this is that finally they are seeing themselves as they really are, and not the way whites would like to portray them. Ed Bullens, author of A Son Come Home, is one of the most gifted playwrights out there. We asked him about the future of black theater. It's contingent upon uh, whether this culture and society that we live in, as the white society, you know, America, allows us to do this because we're doing something like talking to black people, black people talking to black people for you know, the purpose then to uh, get them together about themselves. Would you say that the, the plays that, that you've written and had produced, would you put them in the category of revolutionary theater? I include as black theater are those revolutionary-minded theaters that go to the people and tell them relevant things about their lives at this moment, not uh, a sort of a decadent type of activity which uh, only uh, expresses uh, a type of entertainment or, or, or an escape for the people, but a relevant thing in, 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 the, in the lives of the people. How's Will, Mother? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen Will in years. Mother? Yes, Michael? Why you and Will never got married? You stayed together for over 10 years. Michael, don't ask me no questions like that. Well, why not? It's just none of your business. What? You could be married now and not living alone in this room. Will had a wife and child in Chester. You know that. Well, he could have gotten a divorce, Mother. Why? Because he just didn't. That's why. 
You never hear from him? Last I heard, Will had cancer. He did? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? You, you could have written. Why? So I could have known. So you could have known. Why? Because Will was like a father to me, Mother. The only one I've really known. Father? And you chased him away as soon as you got big enough. Mother, don't say that. You Look, made I... me choose between you and Will. Mother. The quarrels you had with him, the mean tricks you used to play, the lies you told your friends about Will. It wasn't much. When I thought I had a sense of humor, I used to call him just plain Will. But we was his family. Mother, listen. And you drove him away. He never lifted a hand to stop you. Listen, as Mother. As soon as you were big enough, you did everything you could to get me and we'll separate listen. him. All right, Michael, I'm listening. Nothing. I was thinking, Sunday, I could rent a car, come down and get you, and drive you up to see our show. Well, I'd get you back in plenty of time to rest for work Monday. No, Michael, I'm sorry. I can't do that. But you'd like it, Mother. What, we could have dinner up in Harlem. Michael, and, and... I don't ever do anything like that no more. You mean you wouldn't come to see me play even if I were appearing here in Philly? That's right, Michael. I, I wouldn't come. I've passed all that. I see. Yes. Thank the Lord. It's my life, Mother. Good. Then you have something to live for. Yes. Well, you're a man now, Michael. I, I can no longer live it for you. Do the best with what you have. Yes, Mother, I will. Sister Brown! Sister Brown! Sister Brown! Oh, hello! That, mu that must be Mother Eleanor. I didn't know it was so late. Good evening, Sister Brown. How are you? Oh, just fine, Mother. Good. Good. It's nearly time for dinner. Yes, yes, I know. We don't want to keep the others waiting at meeting, do we? No, we don't. Hello, son. Hello. Oh. Mother, mother, this is, this is... Hello, I'm Michael. How are you? Yes, mother, this is Michael, my son. Why, hello, Michael. I've heard so much about you from your mother. She prays for you daily. Good. Sister Brown, I have to be off to see about the others. Yes, Mother Ellen. I have to tell everyone that you won't be keeping us waiting, Bernice. Well, I guess I'd better be gone. Yes. Take care of yourself, son. Yes, Mother, I, I will. Son Come Home by Ed Bullins, performed by Estelle Evans, Roscoe Orman, and Kelly Marie Berry. Today, there are over 30 black community theaters throughout the country offering authentic new plays which reflect our lives. And the numbers are growing. Black is beautiful. Black theater is beautiful. Make it. And now, Black Journal News by Dateline, Philadelphia. Dr. Nathan Wright, chairman of the National Conference on Black Power, announced today that the organization's second convention will be held in the city of brotherly love from August 29th through September 1st. The conference's theme will be black self-determination and unity through direct action. Atlantic City, black businessmen are angry with the NAACP for locating its convention on the white-owned boardwalk. They say that the black-owned interests could have housed and fed the delegates. 
In New Orleans, H. Rapp Brown has filed suit in federal court calling for the integration of all jails in Louisiana. Brown contends that Louisiana Governor John McKithen has promised to jail him for treason. So he, Brown, has a personal stake in the matter. And that's it for Black Journal for this evening. We'll return one month from tonight on Wednesday, August 14th, and we'll look at presidential politics, the semantics of color, and the major events of concern to black America. Juan Gay Segay. National Educational Television Network.